Let's work a few example problems using energy conservation. In this first one we have a mass hanging from a spring and the mass starts out at the equilibrium position of the spring and it's at rest and we're going to let go of it and we want to know how far down does it travel before it comes to rest for the first time. So a typical energy conservation problem. Of course, we would like to say that the mechanical energy at the beginning is equal to the mechanical energy at the end, but we know there are two things that can change that. External forces can reach into our system. We account for that with this term, work done by external forces. And we might have friction in our system, which converts or transforms some of our mechanical energy into heat energy. And we account for that with this term, work done by non-conservative forces. So these E's are mechanical energy. We know of three types right now. Kinetic, gravitational potential, and spring or elastic potential energy. And I always take the time to write this equation out. I always do these steps. It's not a race to get the problem wrong. The idea is to get the problem right. The answer correct. Take the extra time to set up the problem and get your thoughts organized so that you have a chance of getting it right. Okay, so let's see. What do we have and what don't we have? First of all, let's look at external forces and friction. The idea with potential energies is to account for energy transformations that take place internal to your system. If you define the system as including a spring, then we account for the energy transfer between the spring and the block with these potential energy terms. If you don't want to include the spring in your system, then we would drop those terms and we would say we have an external force from the spring acting on our system doing work on the block. But you know, I'm, I like to include things in our system and use potential energies. They're a tool, might as well use them. And so I'm going to include the earth in our system, so that means we have gravitational potential energy to account for, but we have no external forces acting on our system because I'm including my spring and I'm including the earth so I'm going to have gravitational potential energy, I'm going to have spring potential energy, but I'm not going to have any external work done. And in this particular case, there's no friction, so I'm not going to have any friction term. At the beginning, nothing is moving, so I can set my initial kinetic energy to zero. And at the end, nothing is moving, so I can set my final kinetic energy to zero. The mass comes to rest momentarily at the end of the problem. At the beginning, the mass is going to be at a higher height, a higher elevation than it will at the end. It's going to drop some amount, and it's going to end up there. So it's going to go down by some distance. What should we call that, uh, h? We need to figure out our gravitational potential energies. All we really care about is the change from the beginning to the end. Gravitational potential energy, it doesn't really, the value doesn't really mean anything. What means something is how it changes, the change in energy. So we can define our zero to be any place we want. And the two places that make the most sense are the beginning of the problem or the end of the problem. Just make sure that if the object goes down, if it drops in elevation like it does here, you have to end up with less gravitational p potential energy than you started with. So if you define your zero to be at the beginning of the problem, that's okay, you can do that. We could have zero at the beginning. As the mass drops down, it has to end up with less. So what's less than zero? Well, a negative number is less than zero. So you'd have minus mgh at the end of the problem. A lot of students don't like negative potential energy, that's okay. A lot of students like to make the lowest point in the problem zero, so we could call that y equals zero, the lowest point. That means at the end we're gonna have zero gravitational potential energy 
and at the beginning we'll have MGH. That's what I'm going to do. And I only have one term left, and that's spring potential energy. At the beginning, we are at the unstretched or the equilibrium position of the spring. So that's going to give us no energy. And at the end, the spring is stretched. One half K X squared is the spring potential energy term. What is X? It's H. It's the amount that the spring has been stretched. So we can solve for the distance that the spring is stretched. One thing I wanted to point out, when you have a potential energy, spring potential energy, it's always positive. One half kx squared is always positive when you're talking about spring potential energy. It doesn't matter if the spring is stretched or if it's compressed. A spring stores energy and that is always a positive amount of energy stored, whether it's compressed or stretched. But work done by a spring can be positive or negative. Because a spring can push on something as it moves through a distance, increasing its speed, doing positive work, or it can push back on it like a, a block sliding in and, and coming in contact with the spring, the block continues to slide in and compress the spring and the spring is pushing back on the block, slowing it down, doing negative work on it. So a spring can do negative work on an object or positive work on an object. But spring potential energy, always positive. The sign takes care of itself, whether it's initial energy or final energy, and it just takes care of itself that way. Okay, let's do another problem. So in this problem, we have gravity, a spring, and an external force. If we were given the spring constant, the friction coefficient, the mass, our external force is our hand. We're reaching in and we are pulling with some constant force, F hand, on the mass parallel to the incline surface. So we're pulling in the same direction the box is moving. It moves a distance d, and there's an angle theta with the horizontal to the inclined surface. We want to find the final speed of the mass if it starts from rest. Energy conservation problem. Again, we want to say the initial energy and the final mechanical energies are the same, but we know there are two things, external forces and friction that could change that. So we account for those with those two terms. We have three types of mechanical energy that we know about, so I'm going to start putting them into my equation. Kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and spring or elastic potential energy. Start crossing things out that we don't need. We've got springs, at least one here, one spring. We've got gravity, so we need those potential energy terms, but because we are including those as potential energy, they don't uh, come into play when it comes to external forces. We do have an external force acting on our system, though we have the hand reaching in and pulling on the block. So we'll account for that with work external. At the beginning, nothing is moving. And at the end, we do have movement. So I'm going to just put over here 1 half m v final squared. At the end we have some speed, I'll call that v final. How do we deal with gravitational potential energy? Let's pick some place to be zero, either the beginning or the end. Most students like the lowest point to be zero, so that's what I'm going to do. I'll call that, uh, this is going to be my zero height, which means we're starting out h above that. My final is going to be zero and my starting potential energy, gravitational potential energy, is going to be mgh. How about springs? At the beginning of the problem the spring is at its equilibrium position so I'll put a zero in oops, for the spring initial but at the end I've got a stretched spring so I need to account for that one-half K 
x squared for spring potential energy. You have to remember that's always a positive number. Spring potential energy is always positive, even though the work done by a spring could be positive or negative. External forces. I do have an external force, the hand reaching in and doing work. It's the force of the hand times the distance it travels times the cosine of zero degrees because they're in the same direction. I'm just going to leave that off. It's a positive work done. The hand is pulling in the same direction the block is moving, doing positive work on the block. And the last thing is work done by non-conservative forces. Remember, that's a negative value because it's the force of friction multiplied by the distance, multiplied by the cosine of 180. So I've accounted for that with my minus sign there. All right, that's everything. So let's fill in what we know. MGH plus the force of the hand. That's just a given quantity. The distance is given. The force of friction is mu times the normal force. And what is X? It's the amount that the spring has stretched so that's capital D. And then the only thing I need here, this block is on an inclined plane. So what is the normal force? The normal force is going to be, I'll rewrite the equation. The normal force is mg cosine theta. And at this point, the physics is done, and it's just algebra solving for V final. So we are given K and D, theta, the mass, the coefficient of friction, the force of the hand, and, oh, wait, one other thing we need to do. I have an H in here. have to get rid of that H. What is H? Well, if this is theta with respect to the uh, horizontal, the angle of the incline, then this angle is also theta. And the hypotenuse of this blue triangle is capital D. So that means that H over D is equal to sine theta or H is equal to D sine theta. So let me plug that in here. Now we know everything except for V final and we do the algebra and we're done. I'll do one more problem. This time we'll add a second mass. In our third example, we're adding a second mass. So we still have to deal with gravity. We still have to deal with a spring. We still have to deal with friction. But in this case, we're adding a second mass. And we're going to give them an initial velocity. We've always started with everything at rest. Let's give this an initial velocity. Oh, I see. We also have to be given mu. There we go a typical energy conservation problem. We want to say our initial energy and our final mechanical energy are the same, but we know that we have to also think about whether external forces are doing work on our system and whether we have friction in our system doing some work. So now we can fill in for these E's. We know of three types of mechanical energy right now. Kinetic, gravitational potential and spring or elastic potential energy, kinetic final, and we have our final energy. What I want to do now is break out my kinetic energy term and my gravitational potential energy term into two terms, one for mass one and one for mass two. I only have one spring in my system, so I can just leave that as a one spring potential energy. If I had two springs in my system, I'd have a second term there. But I only have one spring, and I'm going to go ahead and break these up. K1 initial, K2 initial. And I'm going to break this up. UG1 initial, gravitational potential energy for block two, initial. My spring, I just have one. I just have to put an initial spring energy. I'm not going to have any external forces acting on my system, but I do have to account for friction. 
And at the end, I have two objects, K1 at the end, K2 final, gravitational potential energy for block 1 at the end, gravitational potential energy for block 2 at the end, and I have spring potential energy at the end. At the beginning, I do have things moving. Both of these masses are attached by a string or a rope, so they are moving together. If block one moves with one meter per second, block two moves at one meter per second. So whatever block one is moving, whatever speed block one has, block two also has the same speed. So this is going to be one half m1 v initial squared plus one half m2 v initial squared. How about my gravitational potential energies? I'm going to define my zero height for block one to be right here. And I'm going to define my zero height for block two to be right here. I can do that. I can make them wherever I want. The change is really what I care about. So in this case, I'm going to call zero height for one where one is now. And one never changes in height. So I'm going to say it starts at zero potential energy and it ends at zero gravitational potential energy. So I'm going to call that zero. And the final for one is going to be zero. But two goes up. So two starts at zero and then it goes to a higher elevation, a higher height. So it goes up from zero and it ends with some final energy. I'll put that in later. Springs. I have a spring in my system. It starts out at its equilibrium position and it ends up at some stretched position. And I have friction working on my system. So that's minus the force of friction times the distance traveled. At the end, things are moving. I have a one-half m1 v final squared. I have a one-half m2 v final squared. Both blocks are moving. My m2 has gone up and my spring is stretched. So let's put in some numbers here. Or I should say some. Let's get these into the symbols that we were given. So the first thing I can do, since v initial is the same in both of these, I can just factor it out. And we were, we were given the two masses in v initial. m1 is the only block that has friction. It's a flat, a horizontal surface. So this is just mu k times the normal force, which in this case is m1g times the distance d. And we were given all of those values. At the end, we have a 1 half m1 plus m2 v final squared. We were given everything but v final. That's what we are trying to solve for. m2g. What is h? h is the amount that block 2 went up. But block 2 went up by the same distance that block 1 moved to the left, a distance capital D. So I'll put that in. And how much has our spring stretched? A distance capital D. Now we have it with everything and we can everything that was given except for V final and we can solve for V final. So I hope these examples have helped. Always start out by writing out this equation and then the following equation. If you just get in the habit of doing that and, and methodically stepping through the problem, it'll really help you. Cross out what you don't have. If you don't have a spring, cross it out, move on. If you have multiple masses, go to the next step. Kinetic energy splits into two terms for each one for each mass. Gravitational potential energy, the same thing at the beginning and at the end of the problem. Add those terms in. Take the extra time to get the problem right.